Turn on your projectors and follow me down the rabbit hole. J.J. Hatter welcomes you to Analysis in Wonderland. Today's topic, Frank Wildhorn's Wonderland. Why does Lewis Carroll suck on stage? Stage versions of Carroll's stories very rarely seem to work, and I've never really been able to figure out why. The few that do work seldom get the popular or critical attention they deserve. True, much the same could be said for film versions of the story, but theater seems to suffer more, I feel, whether the shows are good or not. Case in point, the musical theater romp simply known as Wonderland, composed by Frank Wildhorn. For the uninitiated among us, composer and songwriter Frank Wildhorn is the very definition of a cult classic creator. His musical styling is undeniably infectious, and he often seems to have all sorts of fun ideas. But when it comes to theater, he generally seems to have an issue finding lyricists and or script writers who can match his talents and ambitions. Despite this, every single one of his musicals has garnered a small but loyal fanbase all their own in the USA, and he actually gained the distinction at one point of being the first American composer to have three productions all running simultaneously on Broadway in 1999. On top of this, while none of his musicals have been critical successes on Broadway or the West End, he seems to be hugely popular in various Asian and European theater circles, and his popularity overseas actually led to him being handpicked to compose a musical version of the anime and manga series Death Note of all things. In point of fact, most of Wildhorn's musicals are adaptations or reimaginings of pre-existing works, most notably literary classics. And so it is perhaps no surprise that he became one of several people to try and reinterpret the Alice stories for the musical genre with Wonderland. This show has gone through various retoolings and revisions over the years, so I'll give you a brief synopsis of the history. Initially, the show was produced as a touring play that traveled between Tampa, Florida and Houston, Texas through 2009 and 2010. This rendition was quite successful in terms of revenue, but critical reactions were mixed. After closing in Houston, several key characters were recast, the script was given a major overhaul, some of the costumes were changed, and many of the songs were revised. The show then returned to Tampa in January of 2011. This version is widely considered the best one by critics and audiences who saw it alike. Finally, there was the version that went to Broadway in May 2011. The cast stayed the same, but the script and songs were once again retooled, and some costume changes were once again made. And the show that had been met with praise in Florida was absolutely pile-drived in New York. Critical reaction was downright horrific, the show being met with almost unanimous scorn. It was such a dismal failure it only lasted two full months on Broadway, including a month of previews. And yes, dear viewers and listeners, that version is the one we will be discussing today. Isn't that splendid? In all fairness, the disastrous Broadway run was not the end of this show. There have been some other major productions in the years following, including a 2017 touring version that traveled across the UK. I may talk about the UK production another time, but for now we're focusing on the Broadway edition. So was all the critical destruction warranted, or was the show grossly underrated? The story is set in modern day Queens, New York, where a young woman named Alice is having, as the musical itself states, the worst day of her life. Alice is a single mother divorced from her husband, living, ironically enough, in her mother-in-law's apartment, and trying to make a living as an author. In both prior and later versions of the play, it's revealed that Alice is actually a distant descendant of Alice Little, the girl who inspired Carol to write the stories. Because of this, she feels a strange sense of pressure due to her connection to the famous author, who she claims was an inspiration to her. This is left out entirely in the Broadway version, and while it doesn't hurt the story per se, it is a detail I feel would have made some moments stronger. At any rate, Alice's writing career is not going well, causing her to take up two jobs, leaving her with little time to spend with her daughter Chloe. After she bangs her head in a faulty elevator and decides to try and nap away the headache, she sees the white rabbit run through her apartment, down the hall, and to the same elevator. She hops in after him and finds herself falling into a more modern wonderland. Alice's adventures serve essentially as her therapy, as she deals with her relationship with her family and her rough childhood, all while trying to save Wonderland from tyrannical villainy. The story itself is a little basic, but it's not necessarily bad. Actually, to be honest, most of this show is very good, and when I heard the official Broadway cast recording and saw promotional images for this piece, I thought it seemed amazing. However, then I actually saw the show and I realized why it might have rubbed people the wrong way. 
The best way I can put things before we get into detail is that most of this musical works. But there's one, one problem with it that cannot be ignored. And unfortunately, that problem is kind of a big deal. However, let's focus on the positives, because again, there are a lot of positive things in it. We'll start with the major cast. Again, please recall that I am specifically discussing the Broadway version of the show. All of these roles have been played by multiple people through different productions. Janet DeCall plays a most unusual Alice, different in both appearance and personality than virtually any other, which is sort of the point. In some versions of the show, her surname is Cornwinkle, in others it is Stetson. In the Broadway show, it's never mentioned at all. Whatever you call her, Alice's story of discovery, where she has to learn to find balance in her life between what she needs to sacrifice and what she needs to keep hold of, is a tale we've heard before. But it's still handled alright, and DeCall puts a ton of effort and thought into what she does. She's spicy and sassy and cynical, but also has a vulnerable side and a fine sense of humor. Being the main character, she gets many of the best songs in the show, and her bold voice is especially strong in a cast filled with powerful voices. Alice is joined on her quest by four particular allies, Jack the White Knight, the White Rabbit, El Gato the Cheshire Cat, and the Caterpillar. Each of them seems to represent a specific cultural and or musical style. While some find the choices made a little strange, I don't think they hurt the characters at all, and it does help to give the show a rather varied and colorful sensibility to its soundtrack. El Gato is played by Jose Lana. He is a Hispanic Cheshire Cat who has actually lost his power to turn invisible. Despite the cultural change and loss of his abilities, he's very much the character we all know and remember. Sly, full of himself, and a perennial prankster. The Caterpillar is played by E. Clayton Cornelius. His musical styling is sort of a jazz and R&B blend, and he is assisted by a group of sultry dancers simply called The Legs. He acts essentially as a polar opposite to El Gato. He too has a mysterious demeanor, but is generally much more serious and low-key. It's not that he doesn't have a sense of humor, it's just that he doesn't see life as a matter of fun and games. The White Rabbit sings in a classical style, and while he has no solo number, he's one of the more prominent members of the four. He's played by Ed Studenmeyer, whose build and baritone vocals make him an unconventional choice, but it works surprisingly well. The Rabbit is very much the cowardly lion of the group, as he learns to gain courage and confidence while helping Alice and the others on their journey. Jack the White Knight, who with a name like that may or may not be analogous to the Knave of Hearts as well, is played by Darren Ritchie. Ritchie actually plays no less than three roles in the show. Along with the White Knight, he also plays Alice's husband in the real world, not coincidentally, the husband is also named Jack, and a mysterious character who is revealed to be none other than the ghost of Lewis Carroll. The scene and song with Carroll's ghost, I Am My Own Invention, is very possibly my favorite moment in the entire show and it is handled very tenderly and carefully. While his time in the role is brief, it is extremely memorable. As the White Knight, Jack's musical style is an outright parody of old-school pop boy bands, and in this version he isn't so much an established knight, but rather a knight in training, who joins Alice on her quest specifically because he thinks it will help him gain his true knighthood. At first he's really only out to help Alice for his own purposes, but as the story goes on he genuinely falls in love with her and comes to learn what it means to be a true hero and what sacrifices have to be made to protect those you care for most. The last major protagonist of the show is Alice's daughter Chloe, played by Carly Rose Sonnenclair, who in one scene also actually plays a younger Alice, which is a bit confusing since I'll admit that Sonnenclair doesn't resemble Janet to call all that much, but I can forgive it. Anyway, Chloe is a bit of an airhead to be honest, but I think that's intentional. I love the relationship she has with her mother too. While she does wish her mom and she could be together more often, she still talks to her about their problems and the two still try to stay close and comfort and care for one another. The Broadway version actually slightly expands on Chloe's role in the story compared to others, giving her a few more moments to sing most notably, which is, or at least was, a wise decision, since Sonny and Claire's voice is absolutely breathtaking. We've covered our protagonist, but for every light there must be shadow. The main antagonist of this story is not the Queen of Hearts, However, the Queen herself, played by Karen Mason, is still a prominent character in the show. Just like Jack the White Knight is representative of Alice's estranged husband, the Queen is representative of Alice's mother-in-law, Edwina. Mason claimed that her hook for the Queen, so to speak, actually came from a line in a song from the show, We don't think at all, we simply feel, dear. In essence, the Queen is a character of emotional impulse. She's actually not really a villain in this version, but more of a neutral force. When things are going her way, she can be very pleasant and even genuinely caring. 
but if things aren't turning in her favor, she'll not only resort to executions, but do so in a disturbingly cheerful manner. Mason sells every scene she has, having possibly the strongest and downright biggest voice of anybody in this musical, which is saying a lot. However, the central villain in this story is actually the Mad Hatter, who in this version is a female character played by Kate Schindel, and sweet mother of madness, there are not enough good things I could say about her. Even people who don't and didn't like this show usually agree that Schindel's Hatter is the best part of the whole play, and for good reason. In this story, the Hatter is essentially the hide to Ellis' Jekyll. She is her alter ego, representing all of her darkest elements. As the Hatter herself says to Alice at one point, Every time someone has broken a promise to you or broken your heart, that has become part of me. As the show goes on, the Hatter evolves as a character. She starts off as a more or less light-hearted villainess with just a few dark moments, but when the second act starts, her sense of humor has gotten darker than before, as has her appearance, and she seems to be a bit more serious. By the time the climax rolls around, she's a ghoulish and intimidating creature who lacks any of the humor she had before, replacing it with terror and vengeful spite. Her songs alongside Alice's are easily the best in the show, and almost undeniably the most popular. I also personally like the research Schindel incorporated into her performance regarding mercury poisoning and its effects on real Victorian hatters. Unlike with Johnny Depp's work, which also used elements of that stuff but mostly just confused people, I think the way it's incorporated here is much more effective. Even if you don't know why she does what she does in that regard, the motivation behind it and the purpose is more clear. And while the Hatter is ultimately a menacing character, she's also a lot of fun, and even has a very sympathetic side to her. Her henchman is the March Hare, played by Danny Stiles. I sometimes feel Stiles is the most underappreciated member of the whole cast. His relationship with the Hatter is a lot of fun in particular. They seem to get along less like a typical villain and henchman duo, and more like a brother and sister. There's also an interesting contrast between the two in terms of their villain type, so to speak. The Hatter is a menace partially because she's able to hide just how sinister she really is for a large portion of the show. Morris, however, good god, the only way he could have been more over the top was if they gave him a mustache to twirl. The pair work off one another beautifully, and I also like the rivalry the March Hare has with the White Rabbit. Having discussed the major cast in great detail, let's look at some of the technical stuff. First, the costumes. The costume work in this show is the work of Susan Hilferty. Hilferty is a legend among theatrical costume designers, most famous for her work on the hit show Wicked. And after Wicked, this is probably her second most impressive piece, in my opinion. Her costumes are visually stunning and diverse, mixing the various cultural styles and musical elements together with classic Victoriana and the original Tenniel illustrations. Given the genre and setting of this musical, the animal characters are handled cleverly. Hilferty was directly told not to give the animal characters too many animal traits, such as whiskers and ears, but instead the makeup design and the costume elements help to imply their animality, so to speak. For example, the White Rabbit's costume is padded to give him apparent haunches, and he has the familiar cotton tail. El Gato's outfit is designed with tapering stripes to give him a distinct underbelly, as well as a long tail which Lana improvises with frequently to comic effect. Other things are more subtle. For example, the March Hare's outfit incorporates a crazy, dreadlock-laden wig, which was intended to call back to the Hare's ears on the straw that was tied into his head fur. In Tenniel's day, that was a common symbol of madness. My favorite costume work has to go to the Mad Hatter, of course. I love seeing the character evolve not just through Schindel's performance, but also through the looks of her different outfits, each one more spectacular than the next. From a rock and roll glamour gal to a heavy metal slash steampunk soldier to what I can only describe as a vampire chess queen. You can tell Hilferty had a blast designing these, as well as the costumes for the queen, which are almost equally magnificent, especially her outfit for her big number, Off With Their Heads. Hilferty claimed that the Hatter and the Queen were her favorites to outfit, and it really shows. Despite the negative backlash this show received from critics, surprisingly, it was still nominated for an award during this Broadway run. Namely, at the dance-focused Astaire Awards, the show's choreographer Margaret Derricks was nominated as Best Broadway Choreographer that year. For the most part, the choreography is quite good. It's wild and crazy, but there's a lot of method to the madness, and despite the critical railroading this production got, it's refreshing to know the effort was at least given some credit. There is one song I have to bring up that I feel disappoints, however, Mad Tea Party, which acts as the introductory number to Morris the March Hare and preludes the Mad Hatter's entrance into the story. The song is fast-paced, bouncy, and utterly absurd, 
but there's not a lot of that found in the way it is staged. However, to be fair, the Mad Hatter's intro does follow immediately after, and that number has phenomenal choreography, so maybe they just didn't want to overload the performers and or the audience. On a final tech-based note, the sets are simple in construction, utilizing a large number of spectacular projections with revolving physical pieces and sliding panels, but the effect they create is absolutely stunning. So far, this sounds amazing, doesn't it? What could be wrong with it? Well, remember how I said Wildhorn seems to have an issue finding great lyricists and or scriptwriters? Well, I personally think that lyricist Jack Murphy does a good job with these songs, the problem largely lies in the script, co-penned by Murphy and director Gregory Boyd. The show was cut down for time when it was brought to Broadway, which seems a little odd to me considering how long most musicals run. This clocks in at only about two hours. And yeah, I think it really shows. The first act is filled with tons of in-jokes and pop culture references. In fact, perhaps too many. Granted, they are funny references and in-jokes, but it dates the show considerably. This isn't too bad, but it's at the end of the first act where things really start to go off the rails. There's a common phrase with movies and theater, show don't tell, and I am aware that on stage some things need to be sacrificed in order to move things along and work with the stagecraft, which has limitations cinema does not. However, a lot of things from this point on feel glanced over. It's revealed that Jack's fellow white knights and El Gato's gang of alley cats were captured by the Mad Hatter and brainwashed. Well, wait a minute, when did that happen? We just saw them at the Mad Tea Party, and immediately after the Tea Party, the Hatter goes off to kidnap Alice's daughter. And the next time we see the Hatter, it seems to be very shortly after she returns with Chloe in tow. When did she or Morris have time to capture them, or even sick her other minions on them? But it doesn't stop there. The first act ends with Alice and her friends leaping through the mirror to find and rescue Chloe. And literally, literally in the very next scene, Three of the five are captured off stage. We never see them enter the Hatter's domain. We never see them put up a fight or get ambushed. We don't even know how Alice and the White Rabbit, the only ones who escaped, managed to evade the soldiers. But it still doesn't stop there. Alice has her encounter with the ghost of Lewis Carroll and then her younger self. A very heartwarming and beautiful scene. And then again, in the very next scene, it's revealed she was arrested and thrown in the dungeon off stage. How? When? Why? I can't. I just. just. I. could. Uh. I should also point out that throughout the show, Elgato and the Caterpillar, while I do enjoy them, turn out to be mostly useless. While the White Knight and the White Rabbit have their own character arcs on the journey, the Caterpillar and the Cheshire Cat do not. Apparently, in the first version of the show, they were much more minor characters who only appeared for a couple of scenes. However, Wildhorn and the creative team decided to expand on their roles by having them join Alice on her quest throughout the story. I appreciate giving the actors more time to play, and they are fun, but they do precious little to contribute, and because they do not even learn any lessons of their own, their presence feels largely pointless. Bottom line, everybody in this show, the designers, the performers, the music makers, and more, are trying their absolute hardest to make this work. Boyd actually does a competent job as director, but whatever happened to get the script to be this way, it really makes the show suffer. It makes things feel unfinished. And without a solid script, it's nearly impossible to create a truly brilliant show. What could have been one of the most unique and spectacular takes on Wonderland of all time is thus lessened horribly. Its intentions were good, its concepts interesting, and its cast phenomenal. But to paraphrase a favorite comedy of team of mine, you have to be daft to build a castle on a swamp. And so we come to the conclusions. Rating, 6 out of 10, a hatter's average. Again, so much of the show is not only good, but absolutely brilliant. But with such a shaky foundation, it never lives up to its fullest potential. If you're a major fan of the Alice stories, the actors who appear in this production, or Frank Wildhorn's work in general, you'll probably find a lot to enjoy in this one. But if you're looking for a brilliant piece of musical theater, I'd say turn your attention elsewhere. Top 6 Performances and Characters Janet DeCall as Alice Stetson, and yes, I'm going to call her Stetson here, simply because I prefer that surname over Cornwinkle. And again, in the Broadway version, her surname is never directly stated. I initially was going to give this slot to Jose Lana El Gato, and I'm aware my Spanish accent sucks, so if anybody has been offended by it in this review, I apologize. 
But again, while the Cheshire Cat character is a lot of fun, he doesn't have much to do. Being the main protagonist, Alice is a much richer character and a somewhat unconventional lead for a show based on the Lewis Carroll classics, which I personally respect. Danny Styles as Morris the March Hare. As I said before, I feel this guy is perhaps the most underappreciated person of the major cast. Promotional material rarely features him, and he's the one character I hear fans mention the least. I personally thought he was a ton of fun. Darren Ritchie is Jack the White Knight, Jack Stetson, and Lewis Carroll. As Alice's husband, he has precious little time on stage, but his work as the knight and as Carol himself are splendid enough to balance things out perfectly. Karen Mason is the Queen of Hearts and Edwina Stetson. Again, she has precious little to do as Edwina, but the Queen's portrayal is glorious enough. Mason was a favorite performer of Wildhorns, and while she was not the initial choice for the role in 2009, she was cast and played the Queen through every rendition till the Broadway version closed. Apparently, several parts of the script and the songs were written with her specifically in mind. Ed Studenmeyer as the White Rabbit. For some reason, this guy is my favorite take on the character, and I frankly don't know why, nor do I care. Whatever the reason, that fact alone is enough to get this oddly adorable and wonderfully witty Big Bunny some high marks. And Kate Schindel as the Mad Hatter. Unconventional, but once again, bizarrely enough, this is my favorite take on the Hatter as a character. Almost everyone who has seen this show agrees she's the best part, and it's obvious why. She's a bloody good villain. And Schindel's performance is undeniably the most intriguing of the lot. For all the faults the show has, their work with this Hattress plays off perfectly. Who knows what other wonders await you down the rabbit hole? Join me next time to find out. This is JJ Hatter, and don't forget, we're all mad here.